I will hand it over to Brendan Lichtenthal. Thank you, Dave. So, compared to other spectroscopy methods like NMR, UVVis, and FTIR, EPR is not as well known. To foster growth and help in the education about EPR, we've developed an education package for our microESR instrument with everything that you'll need to get started. The education package is ideal for undergraduate laboratories. At the center of this education package is the microESR itself. MicroSR is both versatile and portable. It's about a cubic foot in volume and approximately 22 pounds, or 10 kilograms. It requires no routine maintenance, so no cryogens are necessary. It has dedicated application support, and it's easy to use, which makes it ideal for undergraduate labs. The software automates data acquisition, data processing, and storage, and there's rapid automated tuning and measurement. The instrument is capable of up to about a 500 gauss sweep of the X-band region and can collect over 8,000 data points. The microSR accommodates multiple sample dimensions and types. So EPR, EPR stands for electron paramagnetic resonance, sometimes called ESR or electron spin resonance. It is a spectroscopic technique that detects unpaired electrons. These unpaired electrons occur in free radicals and many transition metal complexes. One of the key strengths of EPR spectroscopy is that unlike, unlike other methods to detect free radicals, such as fluorescence, EPR is the only technique that unambiguously detects free radicals. EPR was first observed in 1944 by Evgeny Zavoisky at Kazan State University and also by Brevis Blini at the University of Oxford, actually independently of each other. At the bottom of the slide, we see a free radical that you may be familiar with. It's vitamin C, accompanied by its e at EPR spectrum. Most substances are not paramagnetic, they're diamagnetic. That is to say that the spins of the electrons will only pair up together with opposite spin orientations when no unoccupied orbitals of the same energy level exist, as according to the Pauli exclusion principle. And then the electron's magnetic moment is canceled or effectively zeroed by the opposing spins. As we've already mentioned, free radicals have an unpaired electron. One way in which they are created is when there is an electron transfer to another molecule. One electron transfer reactions are actually very common in nature. The electron remaining in the radical no longer has its magnetism canceled by the other spin of the pair, resulting in a net magnetic moment. We can detect this magnetic moment of the radical via EPR. Because electrons like to be paired up, the unpaired electronic state is often highly reactive and short-lived. Unlike many diamagnetic substances studied via NMR, in EPR we are often looking at very dynamic processes. Free radicals are actually far more common than people think. Before you leave your home in the morning, you come in contact with a lot of different free radicals. About 20% of the air you breathe is paramagnetic, as molecular oxygen is paramagnetic due to triplet state. Your morning coffee is carbon-based radicals from roasting. If you're more of a tea drinker, tea contains manganese, iron, and catechols that will have free radicals. Toasting your bagel creates free radicals. Your daily multivitamin contains antioxidants like vitamin C and E. Even toothpaste contains manganese, which can be EPR active and your hair contains pigment melanin, which is also a free radical. Many of the foods we eat and the beverages we drink contain free radicals. Wine, beer, and edible oils contain free radicals. Currently, edible oil shelf life is tested with the Ransomat test, which tests rancidity as shown by the diagram. But with EPR, we can test whenever there's a lone electron, as indicated in the graphic by the blue signal symbols, and we don't have to wait until the end of the process. EPR spectroscopy is used in many fields of study due to its variety and possible applications. This is meant to be a representative list of those applications and not an exhaustive one. So if we've left your application of interest out, we apologize. Feel free to send us an email and we can address your question either at the end or uh, by email.